Hi, everyone. Is the microphone on? Yes, well, we're good to go. Those chairs are far too comfortable. I feel like my knees have gone to sleep. Okay, cool. Is everyone ready to make and find out whether it's truly possible to make a community diverse? Yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> yes! I know it's Thursday, but come on. Oh, gosh. Okay. So, first things first, some housekeeping. Um, I talk really fast. I talk really fast for Europeans and people from out of town. And I talk really fast for locals as well. So, um, I'm really sorry. Um, I have this slide on any talk I give, wherever I give talks. Um, and I basically ask you to remind me to talk slower because it's not natural. If anyone has spoken an Asian language, like Cantonese, they talk really fast. And then I do it in English, and it just doesn't really work. Um, so the trick is, if you see me or I start talking really fast, especially basically anyone, because I stare at everyone, um, just do this. It's really natural. So if I start talking really fast, then you, 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 you thank you, the person at the back. Yes, I will. <laughs> I will remember to slow down, I'm really sorry, but there is 172 slides, so I am going to be going at speed. <laughs> there's a good thing there's no uh, live caption is here. Um, like Remy said, I have done a lot of community work. In fact, I got into the industry by asking my local PHP Northwest community whether I could help them um, with their conference because I hadn't managed to get an internship like my uni told me to. So. Um, Community has been the bread and butter of my life since I joined this industry. And I have a nice stack of badges that, of every single meetup I've ever been to, including the sticky labels that people give you, um, because I'm rather proud of them. Um, and I feel like this kid. Um, I, use a, I love Unsplash. If no one has used Unsplash, check them out. Lots of cool pictures. Um, and I feel like this kid, I don't just do and go to events that are related to my kind of expertise, which is WordPress and PHP. If you want to talk about those two things with me, feel free. Um, but I go to other events too. I went to Django, uh, PyCon, Drupal events. I go to, I went to an InfoSec conference and didn't turn my phone on for half a day because I was scared of getting hacked. <laughs> and they were like, no, it's fine, but I'm writing everything on pen and paper because you can't hack pen and paper. Um, so I go to a lot of events because I'm just really curious about things. Um, and in 2016, I had the opportunity of becoming the lead organizer for WordCamp London. I had um, already done other events before, um, notably PHP Northwest. Um, and when you're the lead organizer, you realize that you just get to say what you want and just demand everything. Um, so that's what I did. Um, and when you're the lead organizer, you, you have to kind of like, you're the captain of the ship and you have to steer it. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you and share some of the stuff I learned from that experience. Um, I ended up being the lead organizer for 2016 and 2017, so the stories between the two. And um, the first and foremost, when you're thinking about organizing an event, um, you see it on Twitter, you see it on blog posts. A lot of people talk about diversity. They talk about how we want to make the event more diverse. Um, and when you think about the word diverse, it means to show a great deal of variety, things that are different. Um, I don't really like that. So I kind of threw the word diversity out the window. And when I'm not going to think about diversity, I don't want to think about diversity. I want to think about inclusivity and being inclusive. Inclusivity is an interesting word because it means the attention or policy of including people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized. Now that to me sounds more proactive and sounds like a better mentality just for me. Um, so that's what I did, because I could. Um, but to do that, especially when you're organizing an event and work camps are fully volunteer run and you run them with a team of people is I decided that I was going to cherry pick my organizers and basically ask them if they would help me make an in inclusive event. And if they said no, I didn't in invite them to my team. And if they said yes, I invited them to my team. It was that simple. I didn't really make it, I basically made it a non-negotiable thing at the event um, because I believed in it. 
Um, I've been to enough events, I've seen it all, I've been here long enough. I, I know it's a problem and I just really wanted to give it a go. So, how do you make a community inclusive? It's actually very similar to when you're designing websites and building websites. You think about accessibility. It's that simple. When you put accessibility at the core of the goal of the event, it actually made things a lot easier. We made accessibility the team goal in 2016. Um, and we were like, right, we're going to make the event as accessible as possible. And everyone was really pumped up and they were like really excited. Uh, except for we didn't really know what an accessible event looked like. So basically, we made it up. Um, and it actually boiled down to this one question that we kind of got into the habit of asking. Does blank make the event more accessible, less accessible, or stay the same? If it made it more accessible, it made it a no-brainer to include whatever idea someone had as part of the event. If it made it less accessible, it became a, the least prioritized thing on the list because it might have been cool, but it, didn't make, it made it less accessible, so there was a bit of a problem with that. And if it stayed the same, it went somewhere in the middle of the priority list. We took inspiration from everywhere, uh, not just the tech industry. And the places that we took inspiration from were from environments that we go to every day. Train stations, airports, the hospitality industry are exceptional at making spaces and environments accessible. Or my favorite, supermarkets. How many people here are from Brighton? There's a fair few of you. There's an Asda in Hollenbury. Hollenbury? Hollenbury. The big one, 24-hour supermarket. There's a massive egg sign at the back of the store. I still had to ask someone where the eggs were. It's those kind of things where you're like, where is something? Supermarkets are an amazing place where you have thousands of people walking in those stores. People walking next door to each other with massive shopping going through, and yet you never crash into one anyone. Or at least I don't. Um, and those are intentionally designed by this amazing, magical industry of commercial interior designers. So, we just started copying them. So how do you make an environment accessible? You copy the commercial interior designers who get paid far too much money. <laughs> um, if anyone knows one who wants to volunteer for a workout, let me know. One thing I did learn over time was that uh, the budget or size of the event doesn't really matter. Um, I'm going to share with you some of the things that we did end up doing. Um, and I don't want you to feel like if you run an event or you're planning to run an event or you go to events that every event should have these things. It's not the case. Budget or size doesn't matter, but it does help. The more money you've got to spend, the easier it is to pay someone to solve a problem. But it's all about priorities as organizers, and definitely for us, we have had a finite amount of money. There are certain things that are free. For example, content. I don't think the cost of content ever changes, to be honest, but in 2016, it was free. Um, we made a conscious decision as a team to be very particular about the way we worded things on our website. We made a conscious decision to make all the um, information gender neutral, regardless of whether the person has submitted their abstracts with um, pronouns or not, um, just so that you just read the information and it was all consistent. We had one person in our organizing team whose sole job was to make sure the tone of voice was correct and felt welcoming. And over time, we quickly learned that you can't just say hard of hearing and then say deaf in the next sentence because they mean two different things. So we had somebody who ended up becoming an organizer because they kept on pointing out things that were wrong. And so we gave them access to the website to fix everything because that's how it works. Um, <laughs> to just go around and make sure that we were using the correct accessibility terms in the correct manner. Um, we intentionally picked pictures to show what we wanted to see. So that's a no-brainer for me. Um, but if you want to know more about that, let me know later. And because I am extremely bad at typing, whether it's in emails, Twitter, or anything else, including my slides, I also got people to proofread. <laughs> 
Another thing we did was childcare, which in 2016 was the first time we did childcare. And we spent £2,344 on it, which seems like a lot of money for something that actually I wasn't sure anyone was going to use. And it actually came from Twitter. Um, Joe is a member of the WordPress community, and they asked if there was going to be any childcare at the event. They knew that I've been um in and ah and about putting childcare on, and I wasn't sure if it would be a good value for money, if it was going to be used. Um, but sometimes you just have to go, ah, suck it, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so I did. Um, and actually, my response to her was, if you join the organizing team, I will make sure you have the budget to have childcare. I am not a parent. I don't really get how nurseries work or schools work. I just figured parents do, so I made parents work it out. So I made sure we found professionals. If you are thinking about doing this, please don't put other children's lives in your hands. Put them in professionals' hands, because um, there's legal requirements that I don't want to be suggesting any otherwise. Um, find professionals to do it for you. This is where the money is getting spent. Set the professionals. And if you're not really sure what you're doing because you don't have children like me, and you're just like, hey, this is a nice person, have a parent talk to them. Because there's nothing like a parent who's going to be so protective of their child to make sure that Ofsted report is completely correct and it doesn't look faked. Um, and also meet those people in person. I made a conscious decision to make have a meeting with me, Joe, and the childcare company we were debating about using to meet in person so that all the nice emails actually meant nice people too. Um, we got testimonials and followed them through. Joe went through and eat, like phoned up people and we're like, hey, did you really use these people? Um, and in our first year, when I announced that we were having childcare, a lot of people were like, oh, I don't think I'll use the childcare. Who are they? What do they do? How good are they? And I was like, I don't know. Um, so I spoke to the childcare providers and said, you know what? I don't know if we're going to sell any childcare tickets. Um, we were selling them at like five pounds so that you, know, you could guarantee your space for your child. Um, and they said it was fine. I said, maybe it'll take a few years to like, you know, people to trust you. Um, so I actually, in my first year, encouraged attendees to check them out. The previous organizer of WordCamp London, Siobhan, um, had just had a child, and she wanted to come to the event. So she actually came along and put her child in childcare. So her first child, Benji, got £2,344 worth of childcare for two days. I think it's the most expensive childcare that child would ever have. And he was spoiled rotten. And the, and the people who were looking after him actually ask about him every year. It's kind of scary. Um, so at the end of the event, I actually said to the community, you've all seen the childcare. And as the lead organizer of next year, if they go through the vetting process again and it's all fine and dandy, we will be inviting the same team of people to come back to our event. What's really cool is that the next year, we sold six tickets. And if you don't know anything about childcare, the space that you give the childcare providers determines the amount of children you're allowed, plus the amount of adults that you are hiring as well. There's a, like a ratio thing that they have to do. So you have to determine that. So we had a maximum of 10 spaces. So in our second year, we went from one to six. In the third year, where um, one of my colleagues, Anna, was the lead organizer, it went to 10. So in three years, we went from one person to th 10 children. And actually, I thought it would be single parents, parents who had their spouses get ill who would be using the childcare service. But in fact, it was people who were debating about what to do with their children while they wanted to speak or submit to speak, knowing that there was childcare provided that they could actually have a solution to their problem meant that they were able to speak as well and apply to speak. And it was also parents who both wanted to go to the event but had children. It was neither A or B anymore. It was they could both go to the event and the children could have a good time too. It became a family affair, which is amazing because I just assumed it was going to be single parents in my null corner. And I think some people might think that, gosh, that was a big risk to take. 
but as somebody who could potentially have children, I wanted to make an event that, quite frankly, worked for me when I get old. So, you know, came out of a selfish point. But it worked, so it's all good. Space planning. Now, space planning is subjective to the venue that you are in, as you, I'm sure you have learnt today. Um, at WordCamp London, we are at the, well, we were at the London Metropolitan University in the two years that I was running there, which is kind of cool because if you run an event at a university, especially during the weekend, you almost get free reign of the hometown university and you can walk down corridors and be like, can I have that room and that room and that room? And they kind of go, sure. And they don't charge you extra, which is kind of cool. Um, or you kind of just omit the fact that you need to pay for them. <laughs> but I hope they don't notice. Um, but when you're putting out chairs and stuff like that, even for your meetups and things like that, um, think about the amount of space a wheelchair act person who's using a wheelchair would need. And not just for the wheelchair, but for the wheelchair and friend. When we're walking down corridors or we're leaving the room, we like to leave with our friends. And we like to stand next door to each other and talk. It's not really fair just because someone's in a wheelchair, they can't talk to the person next to them because there's not enough space. So why don't we just widen the aisles? So that's what we did. We intentionally widened all the aisles of our event to make sure that wheelchair and friend could go down the aisle together. Most event spaces now have hearing loops by law, um, but as I quickly learned, check they work, because uh, they sometimes forget to check them, the venue managers, so you just have to insist they promise they work, yes. You've really checked them, yes. Um, and also lifts. How many times have you been in a lift and it doesn't work? Oh, it just breaks on that weekend when you're using the venue and you're like, please don't break because I know someone really needs to use this lift. Making sure they work and making sure the venue managers check, it, check them. We, we actually phoned them up and said, can we come to the venue and do a run through of the venue a week ahead of time? Just so we could press buttons in the venue and make sure that everything worked because quite frankly, I didn't trust them. Um, <laughs> one thing, one event that I did go to, uh, Django Europe in Cardiff in 2015 and PyCon UK in 2017. Um, both those communities are amazing at making, uh, at running events. Um, and something that I learned from them was the idea of all these extra rooms, multi-faith rooms, lactation rooms, quiet rooms, and green rooms. They all came from Django, from, for me, from Django UK and uh, Django Europe and, and PyCon UK. Um, the idea that someone doesn't have to go and find the synagogue or someone doesn't have to, you know, apologize when we're not being talkative by walking into a room where their whole point is to be quiet. You're giving people permission to just have some me time. I thought it was just amazing. And what's even more amazing at those events is that they actually have a therapist on hand where you can book um, slots, appointment slots with a the therapist, which I thought was amazing as well. Um, there's also the, we, we actually had a spare room that was just kind of loitering, so we made it into, this came from uh, the Drupal community. I went to uh, Drupal Camp London a few, uh, a few years ago, and also their Drupal Con Europe. Um, and they have this concept of a sprint room where people can do work and work on their open source projects together, which I thought was really, really cool. We've tried this a few times at work camps. It's not really picked up as well. But this year at work camp Europe, it picked up actually quite well, and people only turned up to use the sprint rooms, which I thought was really cool when you're in an open source community. Other things that we had, um, because WordCamp London is a 600 person event across three buildings and it's a bit manic, um, we made sure that we had some breakout spaces and overflow areas so you could have your dinner in peace as well um, and just signage towards that. Talking about signage. Signage is quite expensive, um, especially when you have a 24 hour turnaround with your printer. <laughs> um, and so in 2016, it cost just three and a half grand. 2017, I'm almost certain it hit the four grand marker um, and it was painful. And signage, when I first thought about it, it was like, oh, it's just signage, you put it on the wall, whatever. But I went to a Girl Geek meetup um, where um, Lena gave a talk on neurodiversity in the workplace. Um, and in that talk, they talk about working at the BBC and what it is like for them to go to work the simple act of going to work. And they take a video recording of what's going on and it kind of shows what's, what they see, what they notice. 
and they talk about how their autism makes them notice different things that other people may not notice. And when I saw that talk, I was blown away. I think it's one of probably one of the most important talks that I've ever seen. And I don't know about you, but I've seen a lot of talks, so that's kind of something. Um, and I've just realized the word neurodiversity is spelt wrong as well. <laughs> um, one thing she mentioned was that uh, they really enjoyed the idea of self-support, that signage was a good thing because it ena enabled them to get around places without having to ask for help. They just wanted to get to work. They just wanted to get to their workplace. So having to ask for help to get to somewhere really frustrated them because it highlighted to them that they did have a disability. And they didn't want to feel disabled. They wanted to feel like they were a member of their workplace. So being able to create a space that made it easier to sell support people was quite important. I also learned at Workout London, um, you can use signage to create an atmosphere as well as sell support. And in this picture, you can see that we have quite a lot of bunting in that room at the very top there. We have a lot of bunting at Workout London, like far too many, and we're probably one of the few events that has bunting. And we do it intentionally because it shows that you're at the right space. So some things about signage that I've learned over the time is that um, you will always need more signage than you think. Make sure that I would recommend that you brand them. That, and if you don't brand them, people kind of don't think they belong to you, so they don't seem like the same event. Um, Make sure they're bright and night catching and use a reading friendly font because one year we um, printed a load of passwords in a all caps font and that didn't work out well. Um, make sure you make them bigger than you realize. So if you think it's going to be a three, I would recommend them to be a two and just default to the bigger the better. And as a five foot two person, please hang them above the head height because there's nothing more annoying than a massive body in front of me or bodies of people in front of me where I can't see what's going on. If it's above everyone's head, everyone can read it, unless it's too far away. Because uh, <laughs> I've got really bad eyesight too. Um, in the first year, we realized it took almost two hours to put signage up, which meant our volunteers were up at six o'clock in the morning, which was a bit painful. So we, um, the next year, pre-organized the signage because that's uh, definitely saved a lot of time. And we also learned very quickly to have some blank branded signage with some chisel tip marker pens. And the reason for that was if we found an area of our event where lots of people were asking questions or getting lost or looking lost, we would quickly get a blank piece of paper, get the chisel pen, and then draw whatever the question was and just stick it up for the rest of the day and problem solve. Um, nothing like good old pen and papers, eh? And volunteer t-shirts. Even today, the FFConf team have branded t-shirts that is signage. And in fact, I would argue that's probably one of the more important pieces of signage there is. Um, obviously, I didn't change that. Uh, scheduling. So the cost of scheduling is free. Um, and in the middle there, you can see the words room change. At WordCamp London, I used to have, and I kind of still do, but touch wood, um, it doesn't happen soon. I have a very weak left ankle, so if you ever want to trip me over, that's the ankle to go for. <laughs> and during 2016 was a year where I really couldn't walk anywhere. I ended up taking taxis everywhere. It was painful. I was trolleyed everywhere. It was annoying and embarrassing. Um, and so at my own event, I couldn't actually walk very far or very quickly. So for my own sanity's sake, I decided to put 20 minute turnover times because that meant I had time to go from A to C, because we're across three buildings. Um, and it actually worked really, really well. It was really useful for people in wheelchairs, people who have injuries, me, um, people with children, if they had put their child into the childcare system, they had a few minutes to go and check in on their child, which was cool. It also meant that everyone had a five minute breather because you, know, you consume all this information, and then you're like, oh my gosh, what do I do with this information? I need to write it down quickly. You had time to do that. And it also, <laughs> air the room, because these rooms get really stuffy. Um, the next year, we actually learnt that we should also have a back of house lunch in our schedule, which basically meant sponsors could have their lunch before lunchtime, 
so that sponsors who are doing the stands and stuff, and also speakers and volunteers, had the energy to then be nice to the rest of the audience. Kind of a good win. <laughs> and yeah, that was one improvement that we did that actually worked really well, and it didn't cost us anything extra. Live captioning. It's a good thing they're not here today, because they'll probably shout at me. Um, live captioning is probably one of the most expensive pieces of accessibility that we did at WordCamp London. Um, you have, we paid for two people for, per track over two days. So that's six people, two days worth of work. Um, and these people at the bottom have these special keyboards. Uh, they're called stereographers, STTRs for short. And they're really cool. They type things, shortcuts, and words turn up on a screen. It's very, very handy. And when I proposed this to the community that we were going to bring this on and spend more money than childcare on this, a lot of people were arguing with me over if it was worth it. Had anyone complained about not being able to hear what was being said? Most people, and including myself, thought it was hard of hearing that we were going to um, really make use of this. But I had seen this done at PyCon UK and fell in love with it, so I knew full well this was a no question ask, and I was going to put my foot down on it. It doesn't just help with hard of hearing people, it also helps with people with accents. Or that moment there where you think, did they really say that? Yes, they really did say that. You can read it right there. There are some extra AV considerations. We had to ask for more TVs, um, which is fine. Um, you know, the university that we were working with was very accommodating with that, so that's kind of, we were lucky in that sense. Um, but one thing that did come out of the feedback from 2016 was from some speakers who requested if they could have some comfort monitors, which are the monitors that go in front of the stage so that the speaker can see whatever whilst walking around the stage. And I didn't really understand why the speakers were asking whether to have the um, live captioning on their comfort monitors uh, or why you would need comfort monitors. And it turned out when I asked the question of why would you want this, they said, they also did not always catch what the question was, so if they could just read it, it would be a lot easier. And I was like, oh, yeah, that kind of makes sense. <laughs> um, and what I didn't realize, and quickly learned, you can rent comfort monitors. They're not too expensive, um, but we didn't end up doing it. But maybe one day I will go to an event and they will have done it. So there you are. It's kind of cool. Bathrooms. So there was a cost there of 50 pounds, which I'll explain, because surely a venue comes with bathrooms. Why do you need to pay for more money? Um, in the tech community, there has been lots and lots of conversations about gender-neutral toilets. And I'm not the biggest fan of gender-neutral toilets when it hasn't been fully considered. Um, I am very aware of local planning regulations and laws after my parents work in the building industry, so. I get to listen to really boring things about planning regulations. Um, and when you de-gender toilets, it's like cool, but also not so cool. If you have stalls where the, it's not fully sealed, you can kind of peek through. And that's not cool when you're having a like, you know, private moment. Um, so you know, just be aware of your situation. And like we at WorkUp London decided against doing de-gendering toilets. Um, for that exact reason, because the university was not geared up in that space. The other thing is that you might not be the only event in the space, so you have to think about other events. Um, if you are ever going to do this, talk to the venue managers first. They will give you best advice, or would just be very, very grumpy. Um, and I've been to events where they have degendered toilets intentionally, and it's cool. I'm cool with that, whatever floats your boat. But please tell me which bathroom has which facilities in it, because walking into a room full of urinals and a whole bunch of people staring at me, I realize I'm in the wrong place. Um, so that doesn't really work all the time. Please tell me that this room has urinals and bathrooms so that I go into the one that doesn't have urinals. Um, the 50 pounds actually comes from life essential boxes. I have spoken at a fair amount of events. I have been to a fair amount of events. And Mother Nature does like to turn up, regardless if it should be on a schedule or not, just whenever it wants to. And it's annoying. 
just annoying. So I decided to solve that problem at my event. Um, a box, cardboard boxes from Paper Jace, a whole bunch of them, a bunch of towels, a bunch of tampons and stuff. And yeah, this is a life essential box. We intentionally left the lid open and left a personal written, handwritten note in there to try and encourage that it was a personal thing. Mother Nature is a personal subject to a lot of people, so you just leave it open. There were different sizes of towels and tampons and panty liners because I just didn't know what was normal, so I just figured everything would do. Um, and I also made sure that we had extras to refill at the um, reception so that if anyone told us that one was empty, we could just quickly go and refill it. Um, something that someone pointed out to us after the first year, because we only put them in the female toilets, was that we needed to put them in all the bathrooms. Um, and if you're ever wondering why, I will tell you now, people who are transitioning, that's the end of that. The other thing I would say is, if you are thinking about doing this, and I've seen people do this at their events after they've come to our event and then they go and do their event, please do not leave life essential boxes on the floor. Floors are not exactly the thing that comes to hygienic. So, you know, please put them somewhere like a shelf or get them another stool and put them on the stool. Um, yeah, have those considerations. Do not put them on the floor. Just don't. Um, ticketing. So tickets are not free, but the, 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 the process of getting tickets is free in the sense that you, are, you can ask a lot of questions. Um, and, and for WordCamps especially, we have a ticketing system that is run and organized by the WordPress community, so it is actually free for us. Um, it's all open source if anyone's interested in the system. We have, a, we have an ability to, on the form to ask for lots of directory requirements, so we did. Um, we actually made a chat box, because we weren't sure if we are going to have enough money, um, to make sure that people knew that swag was an option and not a given, because a lot of conferences give swag to the point that people think it's expected. Um, we also made a point of, with the t-shirt sizing, that we were, had an option to say that people didn't want t-shirts, so we didn't over-order. We asked people if they needed sign language so that we could actually hire somebody to do the sign language if they needed it, and also what language the sign language needed to be in. If someone has flown over from a different country, you need the correct sign language for that person. We also had information about childcare, whether they wanted childcare, and if people needed a carer ticket. We also asked in 2017 if there was anything else. In 2016, we missed out the carer ticket question, and so because we hadn't really considered the fact that some people need a carer with them. And I don't feel like just because someone needs a carer, they should have to pay for two tickets. And Workout London are £30 tickets at the time, so it's not exactly expensive either. But still, it's just out of principle. So we just basically was like a catch-all question as well. Opening remarks, the cost is free. Because at the opening remarks of any event where everyone's there and in front of you, you can actually set the tone. It's where you say, this is the kind of event we're running, this is the kind of thing, Remy did a great job this morning, and you know what to expect for the rest of the day. It empowers my team to be able to know what I expect as a lead organizer of my team and the volunteers who are helping us on the day. And we even, with the magic of Google Slides, worked out how to change all the turnover slideshows all in one go so we could update them throughout the day just with one link. If anyone wants to know how, I will show you. We also did a lot of work on speaker support. Um, we actually started with the concept, instead of a call for papers, a call for topics. We asked our community what is it that they wanted to hear. Then we outreached to a whole bunch of people with, look, here's the list, here's the list, here's the list. Um, and asked people to apply to speak and also ran apply to speak sessions where they could talk to us about their concerns. And we could try and be really mentor -y and be like, yay, you can do it. Um, we also had speaker mentors on our Apply to Speak so that you could request when you're applying whether you wanted to speak a mentor. Um, and we encourage people to have either one-to-ones or group mentors. And on top of that, we invited all the mentors who agreed to mentor our speakers, because we hand-selected them and paired them all up, to then come to the event for free because then they could be on the front row cheering the person on. 
We also had a virtual green room in the Slack channel and a physical green room where people could go in there and then go, ah, what am I doing? Because that's how I feel sometimes. We also had a dedicated speakers organizer, so as a lead organizer, I didn't have to answer any questions. They knew who to go to, and they were the, the single source of truth for all speakers. We also sent out speaker information and actually had them downloadable as well. When it came down to the social, we spent a fair amount of money, just a bit more than the uh, live captioning there. And, and we decided that we didn't want an alcohol-centric event. So how do you create an event that's non-alcohol-centric without saying no to alcohol? The answer for us was we ate pies. We're a big fan of pies at Workout London. If you ever come along, we have literally hours and hours of debate over what pie fillings we're having per year. Um, yeah. So we eat before you drink. You get your drink tokens after you, you go and get your evening meal. And we also give the attendees something to do. We were really, really lucky. We had a friend of a friend kind of situation going on where someone turned up for 300 pounds with loads of retro games, including Bomberman and all these old Sega Mega Drives and stuff like that. It was amazing. Um, but in 2017, we couldn't get hold of that person. Life happened. And so we actually rented out a, a fit, like, a, like a proper company, proper company, uh, you know, one of those arcade people who turn up with professional kits and stuff. And the cost went from 300 to about 5K in one year, which was <sighs> painful. So in 2018, the next team decided, forget the retro games, we're going to do tabletop games. And what did we learn? We learned that Jenga is the best game on the planet. <laughs> We also had drink menu posters, and we intentionally listed non-alcoholic drinks first. Because when you read a list, once you find something that sounds good, you stop reading. So if you put all the alcoholic drinks at the bottom, you're more likely to stop higher up. Doesn't that make sense? Yeah? No? OK. Um, <laughs> we also made sure that there were quieter spaces to talk, because who wants a broken voice after one day? Um, and our socials were bang in the middle of the two days, so we really did want people to still be able to talk the next day. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of a lot of what we did. But there is always more to do. With accessibility, there's always new stuff and there's always new ideas. In WorkCamp London in 2016, the cost of the whole entire event was 73 grand, nearly 74 grand. Oh my God, it's so much money. Um, and in 2017, it actually went up. It went up to nearly 77 grand, which is painful. And I have it on good authority that the 2018 one went up to about 81 grand. So every year, the cost of stuff gets more and more expensive. And it makes it harder and harder to justify where we spend our money, especially since sponsorships are getting harder and harder to find. But at the end of the day, I'm still proud of the work that me and the team did because we put accessibility as a first class citizen. It was something that we didn't falter on and we made no apologies for. We set the expectation of the event and then we told people what to expect and also, more importantly, told people what not to expect. And so we had people knowing what it is that they were going to get. And what that meant was more people turned up knowing and setting their expectations. All those worries you have as a new attendee to an event, where do I go, where are the bathrooms? It was all sorted out for you. I really believe that I didn't really need to do all of that work in one year. It, quite frankly, burnt me out. Um, but. Any improvement to any event is better than no improvements, and that goes also for the work that we do at work and our accessibility standards that we build into our systems. So here's a bunch of lessons learned in less than a minute. It takes a lot of, oh, yeah, I know. Uh, teamwork, it takes a lot of teamwork. This was my 2016 team. Organizing an event is a time sink. Improving things step by step instead of burning out. Create the atmosphere you would like to and want to be in. The size of your event is not a measure of quality. If it's too much to run a big event, don't. Have a single source of truth, like the playbook that we had. If you want the link, it's there. P 
People do not wake up hoping you will fail. Transparency gets more volunteers, and transparency will also get you more sponsors. We were upfront about how much money it was going to cost, and people responded. People want to help you. It's the nicest thing as an organizer to have people say, how can I help? And as an organizer, I needed to learn to ask for help and ask for help again. Working in the open is not intuitive to the all, but we intentionally put our whole entire thing on Slack so that anyone could log into and join in the conversation. If you really believe something is important, you make the time for it. Five seconds of impact. Uh, work camps are all over the world. There's a whole of 120 across the world and 600 meetups across the world. It's a big community. And it's cool that I'm seeing more of these things happen in our events. But what's even cooler is the other day I was on Twitter and I saw that Carol had wrote up a thing about DevOps London, a, a recap. And on that, she writes, what immediately struck out, struck me was how inclusive this event was. And it made me so happy because in 2017, the DevOps Day team had contacted me and asked me how to make their event more inclusive. And I had given them a two hour prep talk of stuff they needed to uh, keep an eye out on. So if anyone dare tells me that it can't be done, just don't bother telling me it can't. But there is a limit to time, to energy, and to budgets. If you want to see change, please help out in the community. This is an open invite to anyone doing any event of any sort to contact me whenever you want with this stuff. I get paid to do stuff at work. No one really knows what I do. So I spend a lot of time on Twitter and helping people. This is an open invite to waste my time at work. Feel free, I love talking to people. And so with that, thank you to all organizers who give their time up because it takes a lot of work and a lot of sleepless nights and a lot of 2 a.m. finishes. Thank you for attendees who come up with new ideas because you see things that we miss as organizers. And so when you highlight these to us, we can improve it for the next year. Thank you to sponsors who actually spend that money and give it to us so we can spend it on good stuff. And thank you for speakers who share their information with us. And thank you to the volunteers who keep us sane. And thank you for listening. Cheers. <laughs>